Experiment number four, the formula of a hydrated salt. Lots of new terms in this lab to potentially address, uh, especially depending on how far you have gotten in your lecture class, whether you have covered the concept of the mole or not. A mole is just a number like a pair or a dozen, but if you have not covered that in class, we will not cover it in this lab and you can stop halfway through. There are points marked in the procedure for where you should stop. If you have not covered the mole in class, I leave that up to your instructor to decide. So imagine this. I like to relate all of these labs to something that, that might actually happen. So you have a product that has water in it, but of course it's much, 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 much cheaper to ship it lighter without the water, which kind of makes you wonder why they pack water into Fiji bottles in Fiji and then ship them halfway around the world for us crazy Americans to drink and then throw out the bottles. In any case, you need to find out how much water is in it so that when you reconstitute this theoretical product, you can add the water back. So. There we go, a potential real-world application of this lab. So what is a hydrate that we are finding the formula of, potentially? Well, hydrates are salts, meaning a cation and an anion combination, not just table salt, okay? NaCl is table salt, but any something plus something minus combo is technically a salt. And salts that trap water from the air as part of their structure, or water from any source really, are known as hydrates. And they do this trapping of water for stability reasons. The compounds are more stable as the hydrate than as the dehydrated compound. And these have a variety of different uses. You can uh, take a dehydrated hydrate and put it in the presence of something that's wet, and it will suck the water out of it, which can be very convenient because some things you can't heat to get the water out of. Luckily, our hydrates you can heat and you can just dehydrate them you can by, by burning the water off. Now various hydrates uh, trap varying numbers of water molecules per formula unit, which is a chapter 4, section 2 topic. Uh, for example, uh, magnesium sulfate traps 7 molecules of water per MgSO4. Now there's 1 Mg for every SO4 and there are 7 waters for every Mg and SO4. But any particular Mg doesn't belong to any particular SO4. It's an alternating plus, minus, left, right, up, down, front, back, infinite array, effectively, of alternating cations and anions. And you should uh, focus on that um, structural information as part of your class. We don't really need to address it here. Strontium nitrate only gets four molecules of water, but something like calcium chloride, it kind of depends. Right? It's stable with one water molecule, two water molecules, four water molecules, or most commonly six water molecules per formula unit, per CaCl2 unit, even though that unit doesn't technically exist. It's a one to two ratio, calcium ca plus two cations and two Cl minus anions per formula unit. So you dehydrate a hydrate by heating it. You just carefully boil off the water or evaporate off the water. Uh, we will heat it to higher than the boiling point of water, but uh, arguably, if you just waited long enough, you could do this at uh, potentially at lower temperature. And our goal for those of us who have not yet covered the concept of the mole in class is going to be to determine the percent by mass of water in the compound. And percent of water in a compound by mass is just how much water is in the compound versus the weight of the compound before you burned the water off. Just like if you wanted to know the percent of water in your body, you're roughly 65 or so percent water your body is. How could we figure that out? Get all the water out of your body, you would be dead of course, and figure out uh, how much water was gone by measuring whatever was left over after all the water was gone. And that's kind of what we're going to do in the lab. We're going to measure our compound before we heat it with the water in it. And then we'll measure our compound after we heat it and see how much water left. And once we're confident that all of the water has left, then we will know how much water is gone. We'll know how much our compound weighed at the beginning. And we can figure out the percent by mass of water. 
So how do we know when all the water is gone? We do something called heating to constant mass. That means you heat it, you cool it, and you weigh it because you can't weigh it while it's uh, hot. And then you heat it and cool it and weigh it again. And if the two masses are the same, then all the water was gone after the first time. And the second time was unnecessary other than to make sure that you did get all of the water off the first time. If your second uh, mass is lighter, significantly lighter, more than 0 0.0090 lighter than the first time, then you were still burning that water off and you need to heat cool away again until you get two masses in a row that are the same, indicating that you have burned off all the water. Now, if you have covered the mole in lecture or if your lab instructor feels like going into detail on it, you can figure out the number of moles of water. We weigh out in grams in the lab, but we can figure out how many moles of water. The concept of the mole is all about uh, one molecule at a time is too small and w there's way too many of them to count. So instead of counting them two at a time, a pair, or a dozen at a time, 12, or a gross at a time, 144, we count them a mole at a time, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power is a mole. Um, we figure out that number of moles by taking how much water is gone, same thing that we used in the percent by mass, and divide that by the molar mass of water. And notice that if I have grams of water divided by grams per mole of water, the units of molar mass, grams cancel, and since mole is in the denominator of the denominator, that means it's in the numerator. It's the unit we were looking for. And if your instructor gives you the anhydrous formula for the compound, we can figure out how many moles of compound we had similarly, taking the mass of the compound and dividing it by the molar mass of the compound. And from that, we can figure out number of moles of compound to number of moles of water. And that will give us our actual formula of our hydrate. Compound dot, because in the formula of a hydrate, you just put a big dot there. And then the ratio of molecules of moles of water to moles of compound, which will be a whole number. One, two, four, seven, etc. So, things to think about just in practically doing the lab, actually performing it in the lab, what can go right, what can go wrong. Well, you cannot tell if a hot plate is hot by looking at it, so you do not want to burn yourself by touching a hot, hot plate. You cannot put hot glassware on a cold bench top. It can undergo something called differential cooling and shatter. You don't want that because then your compound is all over the bench and you can't weigh it and you have to start over. So you gotta put your compound on a piece of wire gauze. You could put it on a book or something if you want to, but it could scorch the book, depending on how hot it is. The instructions say to put a cover on your beaker when you're heating your sample. You definitely need to do this. Some of them don't do anything, uh, but some of them snap, crackle, and pop while you heat them. And if it snap, crackles, and pops its way out of your beaker, that's gonna have an impact on your mass and an impact that you should think about for its uh, uh, effect on your final result. And finally, you cannot, again, you cannot weigh a beaker while it is hot. The number is going to bounce all over the place because it will generate air currents around it and the number just won't be stable. So you need to wait for it to room temperature, to get to room temperature. Waiting can be a little bit boring. So be it. That's part of life, okay? <laughs> patience, learning patience, yet another skill for the lab. In terms of theoretical things, what would be the impact on your final result if you didn't get rid of all the water? Are you going to have a higher percent by mass or a lower percent by mass? If you're doing it all the way to the end, are you going to have more units of water per formula unit or are you going to have less? What would be the effect if you didn't use the cover and the solid spattered out of your beaker as you were heating it? So you're losing some solid in addition to losing the water, to give you a hint there on your answer. What would be the effect if you didn't wear gloves and use tongs and you handled the beaker with your grubby little fingers, assuming you didn't manage to burn yourself? 
right? So you left fingerprints on the beaker after you weighed the beaker at the beginning with stuff in it. What's going to be that impact on your final result? Remember, you're always trying to look for things inherent in the procedure that could cause your final results to be either higher or lower than what you are expecting. So that it, when your result is higher or lower than expected, because you're never going to get it exactly right. That's just the nature of, of chemistry lab. When you get the answer to be too high or too low or compared to what you expected, you want to be able to explain it. And so having all of these potential things to think about, hopefully you will be able to figure out, did I have a result that was too high because of fingerprints or too low because of fingerprints? Did I have a result that was too high because of splattering or too low because of splattering? And you can go from there. So that's a brief overview of experiment four. Please be careful with hot glassware and hot hot plates and enjoy the lab.